Welcome to Growing E-Commerce. I'm your host, Mike Ryan of Smarter E-Commerce. Today, we're talking with Dave Recook, VP of Marketing at 4x400. That's an e-commerce holding company, sort of. We talk about that in the episode. Dave is very gifted and forward-thinking when it comes to marketing measurement and the economics of marketing. So we talk about everything from attribution to efficiency metrics like MER and ROAS. We discuss the detective story of healthy growth, that's kind of Dave's metaphor, and Dave's outlook on the economy. He draws some really thoughtful conclusions that are both tough and realistic, yet not doom and gloom. Last thing before we start, I'd like to shout out my friend Kirk Williams of Zato Marketing. Uh, The reason why is simple, it was Kirk's idea for Dave to appear on the show, and I also met my last guest, Sean McGinnis, through Kirk. So he's not only a friend of mine, he's a friend of the show. Kirk hosts his own podcast called PPC Ponderings, which I highly recommend. Uh, There he builds hub and spoke episodes around single themes like attribution or supply chain. There'll be a concise overview episode, that's the hub, and then usually three deep dive interviews with guests. I appeared on his attribution episode. Sean McGinnis was on his supply episode. So if you like this show, you'll really like Kirk's show too. He's also a published author with two books. Definitely check him out. Okay, without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Dave Recook. So Dave, thank you for joining us. I want to state, actually, I want to mention today's date for two reasons. Uh, Today is May 11th, 2022, which can be handy for future listeners because we want to talk about the economy a little bit and just that you know, future listeners, what what we know, what we don't know at time of recording. Um, And also, I realized that it's exactly one year since uh, we started with this podcast, so um, that's pretty cool. And uh, I'm really happy to record with you today, Dave, on that milestone. That's awesome. I get to be the one-year guest. I love that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So why don't you get started with a, with a quick intro? What, what are your skills? What themes interest you? Yeah, so I've, I spent about um, 15 years in e-commerce. Um, I started on the brand side. Went into the agency side and uh, and spent about ten years there. It was an agency that did a really wide range of services. So I definitely think of myself much more of a jack jack of all trades, a really wide set of skills, but don't go nearly as deep as uh, any particular specialist. So really, it is honestly I've spent the entire career around e-commerce, most of it working with direct to consumer brands. So it's really all of the supporting skills around that, whether it's a uh, on the marketing side, the strategy side, or um, or even on the tech, because uh, we had a lot of dev that we did in house with the agency. So broad set of skills, you know, varying depths on each of them, but you know, everything in the marketing stack, really. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I think that kind of all rounder profile is super valuable, and I, I don't know my my impression of you. I mean, we don't know each other super well. This is we're getting to know each other today, but um, I have the impression that you're you've got a really good beat on kind of the the economics of marketing and uh, yeah how to how to run marketing campaigns in a way that kind of makes sense so that was one reason why I definitely wanted to bring you on here yeah definitely that's been a, um, especially since I went back in house uh, with four by four hundred um, that's been a huge focus of mine um, it was something I would say about two years ago I was probably a little bit much well much lighter two years ago but mm-hmm. it's been a huge huge focus like my probably the single biggest thing that I focused on developing on the last two years so hopefully I have made some real progress on that. Well, definitely. So let's talk about that agency experience. You spent about 10 years at Ripen. So what kind of business was that or what kind of clients did you have? And and what did your career progression look like um, in that context? Yeah, good, great question. Uh, so I'll start with the career pro- progression. I started there as an analyst. And that's really, honestly, probably if I had to name one thing that I do the best in, in e-commerce is synthesize data, analyze it, look for patterns, look for when people jump to conclusions, kind of point out the spots where they may be glazing over uh, important caveats, right? Mm-hmm. So that that's probably what I do best and it made sense I started as an analyst there. I started the agency was uh, three people. It was the uh, uh, husband and wife founding team and myself. And then we, we were just in a period of rapid growth. So I was the first full-time hire. They were basically taking it from wrangling a bunch of contractors, like five, six contractors to like, okay, let's all go a bunch of in-house W2s now. So it sounded like, oh, Dave was there crazy early stage, but not really. Like they were moving from contractors full time. 
So I was the first hire, like three or four more hires right after me. And, you know, obviously, if you go back uh, to 2011, 2010, 2011, the e-com landscape was very, very different. Um, I don't even know. I mean, if Shopify did exist, it certainly wasn't the singular platform out there that that brands think of today. In fact, we weren't even on Magento for a lot of our clients. We had homegrown e-com systems. We're moving to Magento for one of our uh, bigger clients. So it was a much earlier spot in the e-com landscape. And, and as an agency, because of that, we were still providing a really, really wide range of services. Just yeah. honestly, ridiculously wide. And over 10 years, we were still always focused on e-com. So it was essentially, we always called ourselves a full service e-commerce agency. But over the years, we tried to whittle down those services. Um, in my opinion, hindsight, we still stayed too broad. Uh, we still mm-hmm. tried to do too much development, design, marketing. But that's really what I was um, what I was there doing. And uh, I started out, so I started out as an analyst, manager, marketing director, head of strategy. And head of strategy had a blend of marketing and tech, uh, to be honest. Um, so okay. a, lot, a lot of clients, I was, I was looking at, okay, what are your needs? They're coming in to look to build a website. And okay, we have a $100,000 budget. We have a $60,000 budget, whatever we have. And you have these specific business requirements. Let's think through how do we fit the tech to your need. So it actually had a reasonably high tech component to it and interfacing with developers. A lot more than I use today. Uh, to be honest, it's a deeper tech experience than I need to use today. But it certainly does give me the background to be able to communicate with engineers and developers. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And over the course of those 10 years, by the from the time you started as an analyst, you mentioned not even Magento in place sometimes, Shopify, just a right. glimmer in somebody's eye. And then until later on, the the technology, um, you know, I think we all seen the MarTech landscape charts exploding year after year. So I can imagine it was a different picture at that point. Yeah, that's really interesting. Now you're at um, your your role as VP marketing at four by four hundred. So I think the tagline for this company, I think the tagline for this company is like e-commerce holding company. Talk talk us through that. Like what what kind of uh, brands do you hold there? And then I'm also curious, kind of what the relationship is there between the holding company and these brands, because um, I've never really spoken with someone at a holding company before, to be honest. So, like, is there a sense, is there an extent to which these these customers are like clients to you, um, or is it more like this complete relationship? How is it different being a marketing director or head of strategy at an agency mm-hmm. compared to VP marketing at a holding company? Yeah. That is great, great set of questions. Um, so first of all, we like our website and our forward facing, uh, customer facing assets are really um, dated at this point. So we actually are transitioning out of being what I would call a real holding company into sinking our time entirely into one brand. So we decided um, right around uh, right around the new year, maybe a little bit before December uh, 2021, that what made the most sense for us was to focus in on a single brand, Bamboo Earth. We looked at our portfolio of brands and said, if we're to put on the capital allocator hat and say, if we're going to put focus, resources, money into one of these brands, overwhelmingly, Bamboo Earth was the significantly better investment. It's like holding a portfolio and you have Google inside the portfolio and you have a bunch of other, like, <laughs> and, and you go, well, this is dumb. Why do I even have the rest of this portfolio? Like there's a clear winner horse here. I should just take this money out of this and put it in this. And that's just money. Uh, Honestly, a big part of it was focus. And that comes down to, I mean, honestly, so like constraining factor can be a variety of different things in different organizations, but uh, it can, one of the major constraining factors inside e-commerce is having smart strategic thinkers, right? And like, the number of projects that they can reasonably work on. And not just reasonably work on, but they should be working on because um, there is a considerable difference. I can talk about this a little later about what we were able to do once we started to focus entirely on one brand versus when we were spread across up to six at one point. The the results over the last six months since we've done that are really pretty dramatic. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna rattle through a couple of your other questions because I still think there are good questions about the holding company. Um, but sure. just to set the stage, we are moving away from holding company more into just like, let's go all in on one brand. So a holding company can, it, it can be a variety of different ways that this can be done. So 4x400 had their particular brand of like, here's how we're going to do it. 
the way the sort of investment thesis of 4x400 was we were going to go after really, really early stage brands that had, let's say, $100,000 worth of revenue uh, trailing 12 months. They had a founder. They had a very authentic story. They had an excellent product. That was our target. Because if you rewind to when 4x400 was started, I think 2017, that was really a great thesis because if you have those pieces in place, being able to plug them into primarily, honestly, primarily the Facebook, Instagram demand engine and say, we have an authentic founder story. We have a great product. We still have the founder on board and motivated. We're going to be able to find product market fit and scale it really quickly. So there's a bunch of challenges that exist with that. Um, and the landscape in 2022 is not the landscape in 2017. Not um, at all. Yeah. yeah. So, so I feel like to some degree, I don't, you know, hindsight is 2020. This is five years later and uh, the benefit of a wealth of experience. So I never fault the guys that had uh, this kind of investment thesis, but hindsight, it, it became dated rather quickly and was to use an overused word, uh, sort of an arbitrage type play where where demand could be de- generated too cheap right so but that's the structure the context for like how how we operate is the founder was always left with a piece of equity we had a controlling stake so meaning over 50% usually 60 70% something like that we had a constr- controlling stake of the company and the founder was left with equity what that means though is that 4x400 does have to have some level of an operating agreement with the the owned asset. There are other holding companies where they buy the asset entirely. If they need to have the founder involved, they find a different way to motivate them, okay? So non-equity. And they can just tear up an operating agreement and it's like, I can bill, there's no, like, I can bill you. I can take all the profits, I can not. So it, instead we did have a process where we had to build um, well, we had to build the brands and there is a four by 400 and there are the brands and there is a little bit of a separation. And we did what we could to sort of align interests as far as that was concerned. But um, one thing that, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard uh, Taylor talk about this on podcasts or Andrew or even Josh or our current CEO, it creates like an unbelievable degree of complexity just on the administration and finance side of this. And it was a complexity that took the highest level thinkers in the organization and stole a bunch of their time. And mm. they're working on this problem of this like organizational, like holding companies, sub brands, and how that relationship works. And we're spending time spinning our spinning our wheels on this. How do we align incentives? How do we make this work? How do we do this, this, this? And it's like, I just want to focus on growing the business. Like I want, you know, so to a degree, you can certainly see how some of the like efficiencies that are promised via a holding company can be illusory because they also create administrative overhead um, that needs to exist, at least in the, in the, in the particular configuration that we did. So that's just a little bit behind the scenes in terms of like a holding company, the dynamic and uh, sort of some of the pros and cons of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so it makes a lot of sense what what you said. And if I can draw like kind of a common theme out of that, you know, it seems like on the one hand, you were spreading yourselves too thin with these different kind of bets in the portfolio where it's like, hey, we could just focus on 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 kind of the top horse here. And then on the other hand, um, also spreading yourselves too thin across these administrative exercises that are just kind of internal potentially over-engineered exercises and, and you'd really rather focus on that all that energy and thinking on production and productivity yeah. right right so so taking taking the same amount of brain power <clears throat> or the same amount of brain power that we are allocating to a brand and instead of having the switching cost of mentally going back and forth between administration finance or cash flow for six brands because we weren't like it's not like we raised considerable venture money so the cash flow of one brand affects our cash flow, which affects other brands. It's so it's this like domino effect of yeah. of complexity. So yes, taking taking away that complexity and even taking away the switching cost of I'm thinking about modern fuel. Now I'm thinking about bamboo earth. Now I'm thinking about 
Uh, honestly, our designers to some degree actually felt that one really some hardest is, oh, I'm on this brand guide. I'm on this brand guide. Oh. I'm now doing this. This is my voice. This is my voice. So there's mm-hmm. like, you know, I, and pe- folks in an agency are used to that, but it does matter and it does change kind of the quality of output and the the depth that you can think about a particular brand. Yeah, well, it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's, it's yeah, well, like you mentioned, hindsight 2020, um, the way that kind of structure might have, the, the outlook you might have had in 2017 um looking really different now so that that brings me to maybe kind of a a constellation of topics here yeah you mentioned how kind of cheap and and scalable it was to acquire traffic through like facebook instagram as a these sort of demand gen channels you can raise awareness and also capture capture the demand from from these single channels and then i mean ios 14 0.5 0.5 happened. Uh, the privacy changes from Apple, or or would you say? I mean, am I overstating that? Were there some other things that that played in, like too many people catching on and playing the same game, or do you think? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good question. So I would say the overall progression is downhill in terms of the ease of acquiring customers at like an extremely profitable, you know. Uh, ROAS, CPA, whatever you want to measure it at. So, you know, you have this line that's like declining over time. And then iOS is this jump down where it's like you have, you know, to to use the expression that where where they said uh, we had 10 years of progress in one year and, you know, back in 2020, which was apparently totally wrong. But so you have, you jump forward maybe two, three years in terms of competitiveness in one month, two months, three months when iOS Mm. 14 hits and 14.5. And you experience that sort of data loss. So that's what I would say is that it it exacerbated a trend that was already happening and created a cliff. Uh, but it was all in the general direction of what I would call like tighter ad markets is a, is a good way to think of it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, I think um, all these channels, as they become a bit more saturated anyway, the, the unit costs are going to tend to increase. And what you're talking about there was, uh, I, I guess this topic about were analysts wrong when they said that however many years of growth happened in however many weeks or months. I mean, I think it's a yes and a no. Like the, the numbers don't really, don't really lie. It, the, the, there was this jump, but it was sure. just kind of a, a flash in the pan in the end. Like in the end, it was almost like we were, we kind of got, it's like we got displaced in time, for example. It's like we jumped into right. the future. This is where, in a few years um, or in some time, this is where those numbers will be in terms of e-commerce share of total retail or however. Mm-hmm. And then and then we snapped back um, as the pandemic kind of loosened a bit. I, I can't, I don't want to say that's over till till it's right, right. know that it's over. It things definitely snapped back to normal a bit. Meanwhile, though, yeah, all the venture capital that flowed in on these kind of wrong assumptions, um, the businesses that were formed and yeah, you know, the strategies that were kind of in place. And then you just see demand snapping back. You see um, iOS uh, 14.5. And yeah, it's just a bit painful. <laughs> but it's I, I, I'm sure that it did create progress. Like I, <clears throat> there's, there's no way you didn't in, introduce new marginal online mm-hmm. shoppers. People that never mm-hmm. shopped before shopped online. People that had never done grocery pickup before have done grocery pickup. So like, but what, isn't as sticky is one, the level of demand and two, the ongoing level of preference, channel preference. So yeah. like, yeah, well now I can get in my car and go pick up milk and I don't have to order it online without fear of dying. Like, so, so like, yeah, you know what? There is a backslide on those two things, but I do believe that you probably did introduce new behaviors to new marginal buyers. And there is some level of stickiness on that after balancing for the other macro factors. And so when you do revert back to a quote unquote normal, I think you will have experienced some gain, but that 10 years of progress was illusory because it wasn't just introducing new marginal buyers. It was also um, a massive change in channel preference, as well Mm -hmm. as a massive increase in aggregate demand. And the aggregate demand is going to go back to its trend line. And then the channel preference is probably going to drift back a little bit or, you know, considerably because we're not afraid to go outside now but the new marginal buyers new marginal customers 
those are people that learned how to shop online. A portion of them liked it. And I think that'll be sticky to some degree. So that, that's my wishy-washy take on it uh, for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> not, not wishy-washy at all. I think it's, I think it's a good take. Um, speaking of good takes you, or in my opinion, <laughs> here's another one. <laughs> you, you once wrote that after iOS 14.5, People started cheering on a return to the good old days of marketing. And then your commentary on that was that nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory or a poor memory. So talk us through that. What did you what did you mean there? First, I love that quote. That quote is more universally applicable mm-hmm. than you might think. So yeah, what I'm what I mean by that is that we often drill into, and and you could take this more broadly, we often look at like progress is one dimensional. And, you know, if we're talking about like a really broad conversation about like, is social media good? And people bring that up, like from a, a social perspective and they, they bring up Facebook and, and Twitter and whatever. And here's like all the bad it's done in the world. Part of what they forget is like hearkening back to the good old days of like, and I'm, I'm like blending topics here, but hearkening back to the good old days of like, there genuinely was no way to stay in touch with friends from high school. Like people didn't do that. They actually yeah. like reunions mattered and people went to 10 year and 20 year reunions because they hadn't heard from Joe or Mike or Susie or whatever. And like, that is such now a foreign concept to us that when we look back at a pre Facebook era, we have whitewashed that and it just doesn't exist in our mind. Right. Mm. So like that's giving a big, like broader, more relatable example to this that uh, that people can can relate to. And I think the exact same thing has happened. And, and I mean, it's a pretty universal human phenomenon that you sort of whitewash the past and it is it you, you have rose tinted goggles when you're looking at the past and and it is uh, is rosier than it really was. Right. So I was here in 2008, 2009. The e-commerce landscape kind of sucked, <laughs> you know, like to put yeah. it bluntly, you had to launch specifically around search. If you were going to have, a, so like the, the, the first dot-com e-com boom oriented around search because it had to, like that was the major means of discovery. So you have diapers.com, you have Zappos, you have essentially this wave of e-tailers. And I remember like that phrase being like in the late aughts was like the phrase for, for a lot of the e-com, the big and upcoming e-com. Uh, so you got your Wayfarers, you got your Zappos, um, et cetera. So there are e-tailers that have figured out a way to sell really what are basically incumbent brands through a new mm-hmm. channel. And they're native at marketing through that new channel. They're masters of PPC, they're masters of SEO, they're masters of uh UX and fulfillment around that. So like, those are the, like the pillars to their, to their company. And that's, that's what the 1.0 wave of e-com looked like. What even enabled the 2.0 wave was Facebook became a demand generation engine that could introduce people to things that they weren't already necessarily searching for. So it could, it could, it could be, I'm now discovering something that I didn't already think to put into Google. So demand capture versus demand generation. And it opened up a completely different subset of direct-to-consumer e-com companies, right? Instead of being now what are just glorified retailers in the online space um, that are selling and orienting themselves specifically around search terms and demand capture, you have really some pretty unique companies that are saying like, I I think I have something I can sell to people. I'm going to drill into and niche down on consumer preferences. And there's a subset of people in the world that are really going to love my product. And, um, and that's what I'm going to be. So if you're in that subset and you think those are, those are good businesses to have in the world and they're serving consumer preferences in a more nuanced way, then there's just no way you can see a turning back of the clock to a, I don't want to say pre Facebook era, but even dialing back the efficiency of Facebook, Instagram, essentially what I, you know, targeted marketing, targeted display or social marketing as being really a good thing. You're setting back that, that penetration of that kind of subset of brands. So that's why, that's why I said that is like, 
I think it's a very rose tinted, rose tinted glasses look at what life was really like prior to detailed targeting, you know, granular measurement, et cetera. That's what has enabled that wave of new brands or companies to exist. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I can only agree with this. Um, I mean, first off, I think that recognizing that wave one with paid search, it, it's a pull channel. It's a it's a demand capture channel, just like you said. Because right. and and that was what was so attractive about it at the time, though. That was already revolutionary. That someone is searching for you know given keywords, and you can you can look at that as an intent signal, and you could specifically target that. Um, but then. Yeah, being able to then target people demographically and push at them instead of de- depending on that pull effect is that second wave. And now, and by the way, I think that not only Facebook is challenged, but also paid search, for example, faces challenges here as well sure. in terms of efficiencies. And, you know, it remains to be seen what's going to happen with the future of the cookie, the third party cookie and so on. But right. then that's what what makes uh, so much buzz around this kind of so-called third wave of marketing with uh, retail media, where you've got these very attractive closed loops, it seems to be privacy safe, tight attribution. Right. And yeah, th- this can be another huge wave in marketing. But personally, though, I, I, I don't think it's, it's going to be, I, I feel like that's limited in the scope compared to something like the glory days of Facebook. Um, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. I I think <clears throat> when you look at like, and this is a little bit of a blanket statement, but uh, marketers get excited all the time. Like, it, you, I don't know if you ever heard the expression that um, I, you know economists has have predicted um, nine out of the last two recessions. Like, people are like constantly projecting, you know, like, okay, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and then when it does, they celebrate it. Like, see, look, I'm I'm like this like person that can look into the future. Um, I really feel like marketers are kind of similar. Like marketers have project predicted 10 out of the last two revolutionary channels, right? Like it's like, Oh, Facebook shops, Instagram, product tagging, Pinterest stores. How many of these were supposed to be uh, the revolutionary channel that changes the landscape. And what, what I always look to is like, to me, the North star, is rabid consumer adoption because you always see the uh, the media or um, those reporting in the marketing space around these things and trying to hype them up as it, they'll talk about the way that like this makes sense for um, the platform and the merchant and they leave out the fact that like for it to actually be this huge transformative thing you have to have rabid consumer adoption and like. Yeah. If you looked back at at social media, there it, the, like the consumer adoption was just ravenous. Like, I mean, Facebook, Instagram grew to two billion users. How fast? Like, I just remember all these charts when I was coming out of college. Like, look, to a billion users, it took them only X years, and just showing like, oh, the customer adoption here is just just insane. That's when you know you really have this like landscape changing channel. That's why I think that there is more merit to saying that TikTok is something that's going to change the landscape because on the consumer side consumers freaking love it now Mm -hmm. you can make an argument i don't know whether that's going to exist forever how long that'll exist but at least the argument isn't coming from it's smart for the platform and it's smart for the merchant because those arguments just throw them in the trash like because if the customers don't show up who cares what it's smart for you know yeah so let's make rants on that uh, I mean, to- totally. Like, and and that's to me the the fault there is on the platform side because it, at the end of the day, the platform needs to ensure that there's this match between supply and demand. And you know, right. it's silly to think that you'll ever attract the demand. Excuse me, the supply if there's not the consumer demand concentrated there. And then, um, of course, to make it attractive for the consumers, you need to also have uh, the supply in place there. They need to be able to go there and have a reasonable expectation of, um, you know, finding the, the quality or the selection they're looking for. And yeah, they need right. to care for that volume on both sides and, and then the match rate. Um, so I definitely see it as a platform failure. And like, of course, Facebook's um, or Pinterest or anyone, even if we look at Google Shopping tab, these platforms have been very weak at launching e-commerce efforts. And, you know, conversely, right. you'll see 
Amazon, super strong e-commerce platform, and they've been successful in monetizing that with advertising. And if you look at a Walmart or a right. Target or a Kroger, or here in Europe, uh, it's a, like a Zalando, for example, you know they've proven that they can make that kind of demand and supply math work, and then they can layer some advertising on that. And it's it's a much easier way, easier direction to go in. But, mm-hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, back to that topic about it all being rose tinted. I, I totally agree there. I think that it's actually quite could be quite murky what's out of us, and um, and it's people who, including me, by the way, I, I'm just I, you know I I hear it from from others who are more experienced than myself um, that hey, it wasn't all glamorous back then, and it's easy to romanticize this. And say this is like a return to, you know, the true form of marketing or something like that. Right. But I think there'll, there'll be some people in for a rude awakening. I'm sure. Yeah. One of, I mean, this is this is my hypothesis here. I, I don't know. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the uh, consequences of of these privacy changes from Apple was increased adoption of this metric called MER. At least I attribute it uh, to that. Uh, because definitely for me, I started seeing MER from being a term that I had heard of to suddenly getting really buzzed about, talked about a lot. And, you know, so this is media efficiency ratio or marketing efficiency ratio. And I, I'm a, I'm a touch of a skeptic. We can, we can talk about that, but maybe could you define for us what is MER? And, um, and do you agree that, I, that the privacy changes help drive adoption of that metric? Yeah, I think without a doubt, the amount that MER is mentioned online now re- relative to prior to iOS 14.5 is um, a massive shift. So MER is really just total revenue over total spend. Mm-hmm. So you can you can look at it as total revenue over total marketing costs, and that would include like some like uh, you know content production costs. It might even include your agency cost. Um, so like there's different ways you can look at it. As with most financial metrics. It's open to some level of interpretation. I think most universally, it's used to just say spend over uh, revenue over spend. So I, I agree with you. I mean, MER matters a lot, especially when it comes to the financial makeup of a business. Like there is a profitable MER and there's a not profitable MER. But this gets down in the weeds of sort of the finance makeup of a business and what they can sustain. And, and what makes sense for it versus versus sort of a marketing efficiency marketing efficiency ratio is the is the actual uh, term that we're talking about here but a metric that helps you measure marketing efficiency I am probably so financially MER you always have to pay attention to but I think you saw uh, the the thread that uh, you were tagged in and uh, kind of led to you saying hey Dave come on my podcast was a thread I had about what is my ideal MER? What is my ideal spend? And mm-hmm. to me, at a marketing level, your MER is more of a consequence of other good decisions and sort of an output of other good decisions rather than the primary measure. So when iOS 14.5 hit, we did... So every day we reported certain KPIs in our Slack channel. So we reported revenue, ad spend, ROAS, and MER. And ROAS became meaningless fast, but I didn't like reporting revenue ad spend MER. I felt like it was missing something because MER really is your total revenue over your total ad spend. So we were kind of just quickly grasping at what can we figure out in terms of like, what is the best measure for this? And what I latched onto is I coined it AMER. So acquired marketing efficiency ratio. And so AMER to me, is first-time customer revenue over ad spend. And that, to me, is a much better primary measure of the efficiency of my marketing because I run marketing to acquire new customers or I run paid marketing to acquire new customers. If it's being spent on repeat business, it's that's sort of like a leak or a mistake or, a, you know, like I can't control, my exclusions aren't perfect, people are going to search my brand terms. Like there's some amount of money that does get spent there. But I think of the entire budget as trying to pull in new customers. So to me, that's a much better measure of the efficiency of my marketing at acquiring that first-time customer revenue. 
Um, mm-hmm. So I'll look at that and say, okay, my AMER is a 1.5 or a 2 or a 2.5, or whatever. And that is the more important measure to me. The So if you think about that, what's that excluding? Repeat customer revenue. Well, my paid marketing doesn't really influence that. Um, mm-hmm. It can in bursts. Maybe I do something on like Black Friday or maybe I do something on like something that's coming into vogue, especially for uh, apparel apparel brands is like sending out a, a quarterly mailer. So like you get a, a quarterly catalog that that is like, here's the summer styles or, you know, whatever. Um, and it's a, a clothing brand that's dropping their, their board shorts and their t-shirts and whatever for summer. And you're like, oh, okay, I like this. And it helps win back some of that customer base and gets that repeat revenue. So there are ways that like, I do think it's sensible to spend on repeat revenue, but the overwhelming majority of what I'm doing, especially in the skincare uh, industry, which is where Bamboo Earth is, is I'm looking to acquire new customers and spend on that. So I kind of half agree with you that MER itself, if I were running, if I were, had to run a business and I was just driving on MER, I would really be flying semi-blind because it's missing that component of like, well, how much is new customer? Because mm. you can spend a certain MER, but like that's really foggy in terms of the cause and effect of is my marketing effect. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 totally. And and I really like the idea of this AMER where you're focusing on these newly acquired customers because then it has this idea of incrementality kind of baked into it. I mean, just a question there, like, how, how in that sense are you defining the new new customers? Are you talking about really first time site visits? Or are you talking about first time purchases? In which case, there would be like the difference there is you might be. Um, trying to capture some card abandoners or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, first time, uh, first time purchasers. So okay. not first time visitors. So again, this is actually a thing that we all, at least in the Shopify ecosystem, take for granted. Is that there is a pretty good universal account system with Shopify that distinguishes new versus repeat. That used to be an immense amount of work on the back end. Mm. Again, fa- rewind to my agency days uh, when we were on a homegrown platform. I wrote SQL queries to directly query the database to try to connect these points. And like, I had SQL queries that I ran monthly and like, it had like inner joins. It was a freaking pain, man. And so like, this is the old man talking, saying like, I used to push the boulder up the hill, like, you know. Um, It's good though, because it's it's taking the rose tint off of the glasses. So thank you. Yeah. 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 And, and, and what was interesting is like back then that was a competitive advantage. You had a marketer directly querying a SQL ba- database because like, that's what I had to do to get that information. Mm-hmm. Now I just click three buttons and I get first time customer revenue in Shopify. So it's like, I report on this in like four seconds in, yeah. in current day, you know, and it, so it's a, such an accessible metric, at least on the Shopify platform. And I don't know big uh, well enough, but I would imagine it's pretty accessible there as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and I think that's a huge. That's that's something that can't be understated because you know these these Shopify businesses compared to a legacy business on a different kind, like you know, without those immediate capabilities, there, there are people still facing those challenges. And Google Ads, for example, is offering these new customer acquisition campaigns and so on, and they try to help take care of that for you, or you can support them a bit with your data and so on. But mm-hmm. it's uh, it's an interesting topic. I mean, I guess. When we're talking about you, you touched on a bit already with this cause and effect um, idea. So, you know, I don't think that that this really applies to you, but I feel that what I what I get out there in the market are people who are maybe I don't know trying to derive a level of of action or detail from MER that I would argue is is probably not possible. I mean, there I think it depends on you know how how many channels are you on and and how is your your spend distributed across those channels like if you know 85 percent of your spend is is over facebook or something like that then um you can understand that that's got a high significance in mer where if you would have you know uh, a three-way split or something like that of course it's a bit foggier but you know i i think there are people who are kind of tea leave reading and i get that the platform the in-platform metrics more or less broke overnight. And so this this uh, higher level view immediately became more valuable. But I, I also think that it, it's a bit it's a bit lagging in a way or it's it's hard to to take that number. I think it's 
for sure important to to be reporting that and looking at it. But yeah, I mean, my kind of counter suggestion, like if I also think back to return on ad spend here here in the EU, I pronounce it ROAS. I noticed that most of my most of my fellow Americans say ROAS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the, to me, a problem with ROAS is that it's it's ultimately this this proxy for profit or profitability. Mm-hmm. And many people really they just make that mental substitution and they conflate it directly with profit. And even in the platforms, still they kind of almost encourage that mental substitution to occur. Uh, right. But you know there is a there's a looseness in it where. You know, you're looking at a channel level, for example, or a campaign level. But then, when you're thinking about how products perform and so on, uh, the reality is that uh, it's a very averaged view of your profitability, and and it's and it's mm-hmm. a model. It, it's good enough. I think what's tricky is it's good enough that you feel it's working, but also there's times where you're going to over or under optimize instead of if you would just track the profit in a more direct manner. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think you made a bunch of good points in there. So I, when you said tea leaf reading for marketers, uh, that was the exact phrase I was going to use when when uh, when you asked me my thoughts on this is <laughs> I think collectively marketers probably overestimate their ability to divine cause and effect by like fifty percent. I mean, like I mean, mm. probably massively. If you think about it, all attribution, all of it, is correlation. The difference is, so like meaning you did this action and also did this. That's a correlation. So it's correlating these two data points. So all like data tracked attribution is correlation, not causation. Now there are like platforms out there that try to get into media mix modeling, which is basically like where they're trying to create controlled experiments that that tease out cause and effect. So that's what media mix modeling tries to do. Again, it's modeling. But there is no, people look for like a North Star in terms of attribution. There just isn't one because mm. it is it is quite literally a correlation that you're looking at. This is correlated. These 500 clicks are correlated with these 50 orders. They didn't necessarily cause these 50 orders, but they are correlated with it. And, and, it, and it gets more complicated because these 500 clicks may have had an influence on these 50 orders. And if these 500 clicks didn't exist, there might've only been 20 orders. So the marginal impact is, you know, it has had a 60% impact on, on everything that was attributed to it. So it gets more complicated that there are like these fractional impacts or probabilistic impacts that it can have. So if you want to make your head spin, think about multi-channel attribution. And I have, I, I went down that rabbit hole 15 years ago, thinking that I would come out in some Zen state of cause and effects attribution, (laughs) you know, um, and, and it's just, it isn't, it's a, it's an elusive thing that I, I I sometimes see uh, younger, less experienced marketers start to go down that like rabbit hole of like, I'm going to be able to perfectly attribute these things. And I'm like, okay, I'll see you on the other side. Like I'll be here waiting practically that will have no application in your life and you'll come out the other side uh, realizing that, but it's probably going to take, this is a lesson you have to learn on your own. And I did Uh, like, so, but what I would say to your, what I would say to your point there is I really think of attribution as uh, something where I am really solving a mystery in between to some degree. So I have all these inputs, all these data points, all these, all these clues I also know something about my customer's behavior. I know something about my targeting. So like, I know I'm running this campaign prospecting and I'm excluding a customer list and I'm excluding uh, a customer pixel of 120 day purchase. And I'm also even excluding website visitors of 30 30 days, like any. So like I have, that's a real campaign setup that I have. So I know the inputs, which like a blended correlation doesn't know the inputs, right? Like, so like, It could be showing, you know, Google Analytics can show me revenue, last click revenue coming from brand, brand search. Well, I know the inputs, I know the targeting, and I know where that fits in the stack of my customer behavior. So Mm -hmm. I can take these clues as inputs and then try to solve the mystery in between. And actually, you know, if you think about that a step further, I can 
I can know where I'm making my largest assumptions and create controlled experiments to help me solve the mystery. So like, unlike a detective that is completely at the mercy of the clues, I can go create new clues. If I'm like just significantly deficient at understanding this area, go create a controlled experiment that helps me understand the marginal impact of X. So, but another thing that like a detective doesn't have where this analogy breaks down is I do have an endpoint. I do know what all of these things add up to, which is my AMER over a long enough period of time. Reason why I say long enough period of time is one, the amount of statistical sampling and two, allowing for enough time lag for customers because they could have clicked this ad three days ago and now purchased. So like there can be this disconnect and people look at AMER or any measure of efficiency. Here's my daily AMER. Okay, well, like I can flip, I can turn my ad budget down to $100 today and look like I'm printing money and get a five to one AMER, right? Because I was at $20,000 yesterday and people are just going to trickle in. Yeah, I could turn it completely off and go, oh, look, look at me organically acquiring $3,000 of customer. No, it's from yesterday. <laughs> like, so you have to look at that on a long enough window. But let's say I'm looking at a two-week window or a one-month window. That's plenty. You know, I, the, the, the variance there is, is, is pretty low. So inside that window, I'm getting a two AMER. That is my end point. Now solve underneath that that says, what is my cause and effect levers that get me to that endpoint? So like, it's, it's almost like you give the detective, you know, here's the person who did it. Now go put the clues together to tell the mm-hmm. story of how they did it. So like you have that like cheat code of like somewhat of a firm endpoint, but now you have to go f- figure out and tease out that cause and effect. And I just think that if you're looking for an earth star, that is just a single truth underneath that. In my opinion, mm. it just doesn't exist. And, it, and kind yeah. of believing in what it cheats you of the opportunity to go solve that mystery, if that makes sense. To- totally. Uh, and uh, I love this metaphor that you have here, you know, this detective and creating new clues. Um, and, you know, in a, a classic detective mystery would be like a whodunit. But there are also these mm. um, these why done it uh, mysteries where yeah. actually you're presented with the killer from the start or the criminal from the start. And then it's all about it. So it's a bit like that where... You're, right. you're you're kind of filling in these these other parts of the story there, so it's really right. interesting. And and so um, the the last part that, it, that you did you did open the door for is like this tie of like AMER or ROAS. You're using that as a proxy to say financial success to some degree. And this is where I think I think the responsibility sits on the brand side. And I know that like at Common Thread Co. CTC, uh, they work to try to put this framework in place so that their clients have to, like you're pulling it from them, the understanding of their P&L, the understanding of what does success look like for you. So like some level of strategic, like almost like consulting that like says, you're not going to volunteer it or necessarily put this framework around me. So I'm going to force it to exist. I'm going to, I'm going to pull that out of you to understand where is profitability. But in my opinion, this, uh, the onus for this sits on the brand side. If I'm managing agencies or I'm managing marketers further down the organizational chart, it's my responsibility to turn what is a good financial outcome into KPIs for you. Because to be honest, it is not just a P&L. It's also cash flow. It's also the LTV of my customers, what the financing is in between when I acquire them and when they become profitable. So there's lots of factors that like, as a as a marketing leader in the company, it's my job to synthesize those factors and say, this is what financial success looks like. And then give that to either a mar- marketer further down the chain in my organization or a third party outside my organization that says, hey, at a 1.5, I'm breaking even acquiring them and I'm making good money over 60 days. I want you to keep it above that. Or at a 2.0, I'm making enough money on my you know, enough contribution margin for that customer coming in the door, that that's where I want to be. And, and I, honestly, I think there's even some volume trade-offs. So like, it can be more complicated than that, but like you still giving like a, a, a framework for KPIs that that person has full control over because they don't have control over your PL. So I think to some degree, it's that marketing leader's responsibility to translate, 
hey, here's what financial success looks like in your language. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I really like I really like that idea and and putting the the responsibility there um, where it belongs. And I think it's it's a um, for better or worse, it's a very mature approach in the sense that I think a lot of companies, unfortunately, are not operating that way. Well, I wanted to ask you, you know, how how do you kind of define what good healthy growth looks like? But I think you just did that. So th thanks for, for doing that. And maybe if we have time for one last question, because I think it's related to this topic about, you know, cash flow and how should these things be structured? Um, also, the idea of like, the, the concern that I raised, like, is ROAS really precise enough? Which to me, I just feel like it gets a little stretched when you're when you're really trying to maximize your budget to the point that the marginal returns are getting less and less and you maybe need a higher degree of precision. But mm -hmm. um, I feel that this is more relevant than ever when we look at the economy today. Uh, the, right now, it seems like we are approaching a recession. There are different opinions here. Are we there? Can we turn around? I think it's it's been a wild ride so far. Like supply chains were so tight, and now you hear things like Amazon having too much capacity. Um, you shared an interesting chart a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember, but about a, a collapse in freight demand, and so it's just like things are going back and forth. The whole situation feels so volatile right now. What's your take on the economic outlook in whatever time frame you're comfortable predicting? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you could break it down into like a lot of varying like measures of economic uh, health, so to speak, at least uh, like relative to our industry, uh, relative to uh, e-commerce. And I think that there's like there's there's I would bucket this in two things like there there are things that I could comment on that I think are very concrete and like that's the trend that is happening. And I think there are things that I could comment on that are like getting like a little, little bit more hypothetical, like, okay, well, if this domino hits that domino and then, you know, mm. th this will be the, the result. So I think in the concrete area, we do have some of the, we have some things from 2021 that were headwinds for e-commerce that are unwinding. So like freight is one of them. Um, so freight is coming down and, and actually I would even just lump this into just transport. Um, so like both like freight overseas, as well as like trucking. Um, cause both of those were like ridiculously tight. It was hard to even just get something trucked from A to B, um, as well as to, to get, um, you know, to ship something in from, from overseas. They, the one, so like the, the current trend of that is coming down, which makes sense because basically you have the total capacity to move things in the United States or in the world is somewhat fixed. Like you yeah. can't just get like, you can't just double the amount of ships that exist or double the amount of throughput uh, that's happening on the ocean or through the ports, actually, which like we all saw uh, last year was like a, a big bottleneck is the actual ports. Same thing with trucking, right? Um, so you can't just, we can't just 100% increase those types of things. So it makes sense that there's kind of a fixed capacity there. And what we know uh, from like some, some economic data out there is that inventories for retailers are up. So like retailers are holding a high, much higher amount of inventory than they were even in 2020. So we're, we have elevated levels of inventory, which means that we are not banging on China's door. We're not banging on India's door, whoever, for more goods. So the total amount of goods coming through that pipe is coming down and down and down. So that means, you know, supply demand. So the prices are going to start, you know, keep coming down for both freight and transport. So that's one thing that is concrete that's happening. There's this now there's like a hypothetical, there's definitely a scare again in China's ports, ability mm -hmm. to export lockdowns with COVID. So like, mm -hmm. this is where like markets react to uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty. I don't know what, what shipping is going to look like out of China in six months. It is, it's basically entirely dependent on what a totalitarian government does in reaction to a virus, which is like two levels of, I can't predict it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like, do they just start giving out effective vaccines? I don't know. Does the virus keep spreading or is there what they're doing like effective there? I don't know. So that's just a big question mark. So putting that aside, I think that freight and transport are coming down. That's a good trend. That's a big question mark of like how that will impact that trend, because I don't know, you know, that's like two, three dominoes away from, from that. 
The second like concrete thing that I would say is happening is it's obvious that there is a tightening of capital. Like um, I, I saw somebody tweet out a statistic that the stock market simply has $17 trillion less capitalization in it. And that's, that equates to something around like 20% or something like that, right? So it's wow. like, there's just simply $17 trillion not invested that was previously invested. And that's, we're just talking about the stock market. We're not talking about bonds. We're not talking about private markets. So it's like, so part of that is people are dialing back margin. Uh, people are, people are not, you know, they're, they're less likely to be taking out loans. Less businesses are less likely. Investing institutions are less likely. They're, so they're less likely to be doing leverage plays. So there's simply less capital available. So what that does mean is that there's a higher emphasis on what you do with the capital that you are given or have. So, and free cash flow is a measure of that, that, that is saying, in fact, free cash flow over something like working capital or uh, total equity invested. I've talked to a couple of investors that are, I consider pretty smart people. And they said, well, I'll look at it. If I were looking at a cash flowing asset and determining how successful that cash flowing asset is for me. I would look at a years of ca- a year of cash flow over the total amount of invested capital in that asset. So I might have paid $5 million for that business plus there's a million dollars of working capital and I'm looking at a million dollars of free cash flow over 6 million dollars my invested capital. Is 16% annually good for me? And that would be what somebody at an investing level would be doing. So the reason why I say give you that those parameters is because we're entering a spot where those value investors, those cash flow investors are, that's the mentality of more and more investors right now because they don't want to be investing in something that is going to yield enterprise value appreciation over three, four, five years and it's not going to give off cash flow. Sort of riskier assets come at a much bigger discount at, at a point like this. So what that means for e-com operators is <clears throat> either you're bootstrapped and that's something that you're probably already thinking about. Is, is is like creating cash flow for the money that you have in your business. And, and it is going to become harder because you're bootstrapped, but like the cost of capital, if you're taking out debt, is going to go up. So uh, you're going to see banks increase the APRs. You're, if you're get, if you have a line of credit, probably going to see some tightness around like your clear cut, like your revenue-based lending models, because they're going to, because like upstream of them, their capital is getting tighter. So it's, it's just like these are downstream. It's a big squeeze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like the ultimate thing is capital is less available, both in the form of debt and equity. You're going to have to be efficient at creating free cash flow divided by the amount of invested capital. Go do so. So it's like the game is the same. The rules are the same. The game just got harder. It went up a difficulty. You're playing on normal. Now you're playing on hard, like to use a video game analogy. Okay. So that that's that's happening. And it, and it will continue happening. The last one that I think is more hypothetical than most people, uh, I think people are jumping to a bit of a conclusion around uh, what I would call a recession. So I think that there's a tightening in capital markets that's conclusive. I think that there is a, a, you know, a good thing in terms of freight. I think that's relatively conclusive, like that, that's turning in the right direction. But a recession implies lower aggregate demand and uh, higher unemployment. So total aggregate demand right now is shifting more from goods to services. People are getting outside. So Hilton stock is going up. People are getting on planes. People are going places. They're going out to restaurants. They're like, the world is healing, quote unquote, right? Like we're unwinding <laughs> yeah. the People are buying less stuff online. And so they're buying less. I was going to say DVDs, but who? Uh, who buys the anymore? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, oh, yeah, you dated I'm, yourself with that one, <laughs> right? And they're going to Disney World. Like I was going to use a Disney yeah. example of like they're buying less D- Disney DVDs. I don't know. Yeah, they're buying less their, Disney I'm stuff pretty sure cable. that's their Disney Plus subscription, not their Disney. Right, DVDs, right. Okay. But, but, yeah, but but they're going to Disney World, so it's like it's that shift mm-hmm. of goods to services. So, um, yeah. and goods were well above trend line. Like we were we were benefiting mm-hmm. from that, meaning like yeah, disproportionate. So, so, so like bigger picture here might be something more like, yeah, 
more like a stagflation or something like this or and, and but we might be or let me say it like this maybe we're more in kind of in recession territory as in e-commerce as a subset of the larger economy where other that parts of the economy are probably a good way to phrase it because like if the consumption of goods, the shopping online is going through a lower demand period, that is that can feel like a recession, so to speak, for your industry. Um, mm. Even if the broader economy doesn't necessarily experience a recession, relatively speaking, you could still feel like it is because you have lower total demand than, than the wider uh, economy. So regardless of what happens next, and like, I honestly, I... I think even economists are like, I don't know. There's there's too many different factors here, whether whether we're actually going to enter a recession, whether we're actually going to have suppressed total demand, or we're actually going to start to have higher unemployment. I think that people speaking too confidently about that are doing just that. Like, I don't think that's anything that's concrete right now. I think it is something several dominoes down. But I think your point here that the e-commerce industry because people are consuming less goods, they're online a little bit less, they're getting back out in the real world, could certainly feel its own relative recession. Well, I mean, boy, that, that's like a, I'll put that at like a cautiously optimistic note that, you know, maybe <laughs> the econ- that maybe the economy is not in for a recession here. Let's see. We don't yeah. know. Although, um, unfortunately, seems like lean times ahead for us in e-commerce. But let, let's... I've 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 taken way too much of your time. Let's end on a on a more positive note. Are there any like projects, companies, people that you want to shout out? Well, I mean, I, I'm all that like doom and gloom aside. I'm actually very excited about what we're doing with Bamboo Earth. Like I mm-hmm. I we've we've managed to grow month over month for the last six months. Um, so like our focus. I told you at the beginning of this podcast that our focus on that one brand was paying out significantly. So like we every single month for six months from what I would consider our low point, so to speak, we've been growing and we have been able to turn things around. So I do think that like ending this on a positive note, I think I said this on Twitter recently, is that like you're rel- like entrepreneurs, founders, operators are people that generally take a high amount of agency over their own destination, you know, over where they're going. And I I think that's a good thing. And I think it's the time to stress that more than ever, because very often a lot of people look at the economy and want to feel victim, like Mm. almost want an excuse for why I'm down year over year, why things are hard right now, et cetera. Like, again, the rules are the same. The game went up a difficulty, but that doesn't mean that you can't still go win. Like, and, and so like we, we currently are, and I'm not saying that we're going to continue winning, but I, I think that to some degree, ignoring those macro factors, like it's, it's smart to stay apprised of what's going on around you and to know that freight costs mm-hmm. might be rising, to know that aggregate demand might be collapsing, to know that it might be more expensive to hire employees because like you need to keep some level of like clear eyedness about like potential risks, risks and potential things going on. But dwelling on that too much is really a scapegoat to good um, to good uh, outcomes. So, like, ignore the scape, like, acknowledge the risks, bake that into your finances. But marketers, go ignore that macro and go be the exception because you can. Like, even if you have a, an overall downtrend, you can still be in that top five percent, top ten percent that is gaining. So, like, it's totally possible. It's a harder difficulty right now, but keep your head down and and do the things that drive growth and solve those hard puzzles and work on those hard stuff. And honestly, ignore the macro because you're, mm. you're it doesn't help to dwell on oh well everyone's down. Like it might be like mentally easing to give yourself that scapegoat, but like don't let it be. Um, you know, play the game and uh, it's still winnable. Yeah, I love that. Kind of like keep your head down, focus on those brilliant basics. And and also, too, if we think about like earlier, we're talking about um, that sort of bubble that occurred in um, e-commerce share of total retail. Um, but we were sort of maybe seeing a glimpse of the future. And I think e-commerce remains um, fundamentally viable and a great and exciting area to be. And, you know, the big picture is is looking super promising. But I want to thank you again for your time today. And where, where can we find you online? 
Uh, you can find me definitely on Twitter at uh, Dave Recook. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn more rarely, but you can find me there as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, Twitter, Twitter, LinkedIn. Thanks so much for your time today, Dave. And uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Rick. Thanks for listening to Growing E-Commerce. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider sharing it with coworkers, friends, or in your professional network. We really appreciate it. This podcast is produced by Smarter E-Commerce. To learn more, visit smarter-ecommerce.com. Mm-hmm.